Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, welcome to today's event uh, in which we'll be exploring some of the issues around the intersection of religion and healthcare. My name is Stephen Evans. I'm the Chief Executive of the National Secular Society. For those of you that aren't familiar with our work, uh, we're a non-profit campaigning organisation uh, purely focused on a separation, achieving a separation between religion and the state. So we work for a secular state in which everyone's rights are equally respected and their freedoms are properly balanced to ensure that no one is either advantaged or disadvantaged on account of their beliefs. A society where the right to religious freedom is always balanced against the right to be free from other people's religion and not to have other people's religion imposed upon you. Um, and it's clear that religion can have profound consequences on other people's health and well-being. One only has to think back to the tragic death in 2012 of the woman in an Irish hospital who um, suffered complications during pregnancy, uh, was denied an abortion under Irish law um, that could have actually saved her life. She was told by hospital staff that this is a Catholic country. Well, Ireland is perhaps less of a Catholic country as a result of what happened there. Uh, reform to Ireland's uh, abortion law is well underway. And hopefully we'll see the back of blasphemy as well following yesterday's referendum. Um, but today I think we'll be looking at a whole host of other ways in which religion can uh, impede onto the lives and freedoms of others. How it can impact on people's lives, their health, their well-being and even their death. Um, all pretty heavy stuff, I appreciate, for this time on a Saturday morning, but if the tea and coffee hasn't, uh, <laughs> if it hasn't sufficiently stimulated you, I know that our speakers today absolutely will. Um, we've got some real leaders in their field with you today, and I know that you're going to enjoy hearing from them. Look, if you support the work we do at the National Secular Society, we are a membership organisation. Um, all the work we do, all the campaigning, the lobbying, the advocacy work, uh, the casework that we do, and indeed events like today, are only made possible through the contributions of our members and supporters. And I know that plenty of you have made a donation as well when buying your tickets today, uh, on top of the ticket price, so I do thank you for that. But if you're not a member, please do consider joining us. Uh, you can do that online or by speaking to any of our staff here today. So, um, that's all for me for now. I do hope you enjoy today. For now, I'm going to hand you over to uh, the chair of our Secular Medical Forum, your host for today, and our keynote speaker, Dr. Anthony Lemper. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Good morning, and welcome to uh, what is the world's first healthcare and secularism <laughs> conference. Thank you for coming. Soon I'll have the pleasure of introducing what I hope you'll agree is our fantastic lineup of speakers from a broad range of disciplines and backgrounds. Please make sure your mobile phones are switched off or on silent mode. Recently I was asked how this conference might differ from one on healthcare and religion. And the answer lies in the lens. For any individual, religious belief may be positive, negative or neutral. For their health. A secular lens focuses the mind on those areas of healthcare potentially destabilised or compromised by religious belief and by some practices. So to start with today, what does healthcare mean? What might we hold in mind throughout the day? Health, being free from illness or injury, both physical and mental. Care, looking after, giving consideration to doing things right to avoid damage or, in, or injury. And there's another ingredient without which we may keep people alive, but their health and their care will necessarily suffer. Kindness. To be kind to patients, we must also be kind to each other and to ourselves. And I ask you to bear that in mind, please, as you engage our speakers today who've been good enough to join us. In the healthcare setting, kindness means more than going the extra mile or doing what we think is right. It means empowering informed patients to make the treatment choices that they think are right for them. Kindness gets to the heart of secularism because a secular society gives everyone a fair crack of the whip. 
and gives no one more or less favourable treatment just because of their personal beliefs. And yet our society is by no means alone in providing many examples of people being given more favourable treatment precisely because of their affiliation to a religious community. Thought for the day, 26 reserved seats for bishops in the Lords, the legal requirement for daily prayer in our community schools, and paid NHS employment contingent on belief, hospital chaplains. People excluded from and exposed to these uh, privileges often ask why they're being discriminated against. Are believers intrinsically more worthy? Are their views more valuable? And by setting the backdrop for our society, these privileges skew the landscape and undermine the principle of fair play, supposedly a British virtue. This has wider consequences, including on healthcare, that may not always be immediately apparent. Earlier this month, I heard on the radio an NHS chaplain speaking, and she spoke of how she was available for everyone. Even those who initially rejected her, she said, eventually called out, or oh, you, and they'd have a great conversation. She could multitask as well and say prayers for those extra lucky patients who happened to share the beliefs of her appointing faith community. Her story made me wonder whether she'd ever considered that when the job of a GP or an MP was largely or solely restricted to men, wouldn't those men have spoken along similarly self-congratulatory lines, blissfully or willfully ignorant of the many other people who might have done the job just as well, perhaps better, had they only been allowed the opportunity to apply for it? And maybe some of the patients in their hospital beds the captive audience, if you will, would have spoken to anyone, dog collar or not, privileged with access to wards outside visiting hours. And just maybe, she didn't say, some patients spoke to ask her why limited NHS resources were being used to employ pastoral care workers chosen by faith and belief communities. In other words, why the NHS does not have a policy of equality for employment and equality for service provision. We don't have to agree with patients' views. We do, as healthcare provide professionals, have a responsibility to facilitate patients' access to the treatment options that are right for them. The principle of autonomy, the right to decide for oneself what happens to one's own body, widely regarded as the most important medical ethic. The other main ones being beneficence, doing what's best for the patient, non-maleficence, not causing unnecessary harm, and justice. For without autonomy, people have things done to them or withheld from them without their understanding, without their consent, and sometimes against their will. And this is not conducive to good health. For we're all patients at one time or another, seeking help when we need it, not on a whim, which makes us particularly vulnerable when we do need help. Facilitating autonomy may present a challenge to our own values. Healthcare professionals are trained to help people. And it may be very tempting to give a treatment to a patient that we would want were we in their shoes. Our role, though, is to provide professional expertise separate from our personal opinions and prejudices so patients can choose from the available options. For example, a blood transfusion for someone who suffered major trauma may be life-saving. If the patient's a Jehovah's Witness and we're sure that they've made it explicitly clear, either now or in the past, perhaps through an advanced decision, that they wouldn't want this treatment, even to the point of death, then it is more than disrespectful, an assault to provide that treatment for them, however well-meaning our intentions. And whether you believe in hell or not, the road to somewhere very dark is paved with unmodulated and unreconstructed good intentions. Another fairly regular example has been that of a pharmacist handing back the prescription for emergency contraception to the patient, advising her to go elsewhere for her treatment because this conflicts with the pharmacist's own conscientious views. Until recently, such pharmacists were supported by their regulatory body. No longer. Last year, the General Pharmaceutical Council responded to some of our consultation responses and led the way amongst UK medical regulatory bodies in recognising the balance in these interactions must be shifted in favour of patients 
who are seeking professional help. They recognise that the right of a healthcare professional to express their own views at work reaches a limit where this risks compromising patient care. There is no equivalence between a patient and a healthcare professional. The cards are heavily stacked against the patient, who may not be aware of their rights or of the various treatment options. So we do now approximate to a secular healthcare system in some of these areas, but we're not there yet. Many people still experience significant harm, directly or indirectly, due to the impact of other people's beliefs. Usually this happens when the healthcare professional has a different belief to the patient. It may also happen when people within certain communities are led to follow an intervention despite medical evidence for its futility or harm. Children in some religious communities may be given no option but the religious option. Even when this conflicts with the treatment that children outside these communities would be offered and even when it conflicts with child safeguarding standards. In some cases, the courts have intervened, ruling that children cannot be denied life-saving treatments such as blood transfusions on the basis of their parents' beliefs. It's not a parent's right to express their own autonomy through their child's body. In practice, patient autonomy is sometimes limited by factors outside healthcare as well, such as religious privilege. With suicide itself decriminalised in 1961, most people in the UK, religious or not, would like the law to change further. To allow the possibility of their being helped to die, legally, when they feel that their life is unbearable, with no reasonable prospect of improvement, and when they're desperate enough to ask, sometimes beg, for help to end their suffering humanely. Questions have been asked as to whether this is a secular concern at all, because there are both non-religious arguments and non-religious people on both sides of this debate. While setting aside people's individual views, the major concerted opposition has come from organised religion. The 2006 Lords debate on the subject was notable for the intemperate contributions of the bishops on the reserved benches. Since then, recognising that an argument based on sanctity of life falls on increasingly unreceptive ears, many of the same opponents have modified their script expressing concern for vulnerability, for example, a concern that signally fails to address existing vulnerabilities in the current system. And what about conversion therapy, attempts to change one's sexual orientation, invariably just in the one direction? Is this a secular concern? Well, it is a personal choice as to whether one is comfortable with one's sexual orientation. Meaningful choice relies on information and education. Some of the mainly young people accessing or being directed to conversion therapy will have been actively shielded by their community from exposure to the wider spectrum of normal sexuality. Organised religion has led the line in promoting heterosexuality um, and marriage. And it's almost exclusively people coming from faith communities who seek this ineffective cure for a non-existent illness. For those raised in a secular environment, it can be easy to be complacent, to underestimate just how difficult it is for children and adults brought up in a tight religious community to challenge or escape the demands of that community when their parents, their friends, their relatives are so heavily invested in the faith community and its pervading ideology. And what about Aggressive protesting outside abortion centres, harassment or free speech, secular concern or not? Well, agree or disagree with abortion or exclusion zones, it's again almost exclusively religious so-called pro-lifers who attempt to interfere with other people's choices about their own bodies and to disrupt abortion services. Abortion services, remember, which we have on mainland Britain, after decades of misery and death from backstreet abortions, in which many people in many countries still tied to religious dogma still don't have. This is why these are secular issues. The opposite of secularism is sectarianism, creating divisive, religiously polarised societies. In Northern Ireland, for example, deeply divided along sectarian lines, whilst unified 
by Common Christian Thread, women's sexual health rights and the rights of the LGBTQI community lag way behind those of mainland Britain. In Northern Ireland, less than 20 women last year were allowed an abortion under a combination of 19th and mid 20th century legislation, although there have been some positive moves afoot this week. There is a striking anomaly in the interpretation of these laws. The 1861 Offences Against the Person Act is still used to prosecute women in England and Wales, as well as Northern Ireland, for non-authorised abortions. And it was previously used to prosecute consenting sex between adults of the same gender. It's not used to protect some children from grievous bodily harm. Born into a Jewish or Muslim community, the law that should safeguard a child from having a healthy, sensitive, erogenous, functional part of his body removed whilst too young to consent, dissent or resist is simply not used if he is male. The hoops that must be jumped through to justify this anomaly are laid bare in the 2013 guidance of the UK doctor's regulatory body, the GMC, on procedures provided for mainly religious or cultural reasons, which cuts to the quick, if you will, by focusing as an example almost entirely on ritual male circumcision. Ordinarily, doctors must use our skills to treat illness, not normality. And when doing so, we should use the least invasive, most effective treatment for a particular ailment. Ordinarily, doctors risk our registration if we don't act on concerns that a vulnerable child or adult is at risk of serious harm. Yet in this one context, the GMC ducks and weaves through labyrinthine guidance to a position that I summarise as follows. Should a child's parents believe it to be in his best interest for their male child's genitals to be surgically assigned to their own belief system or culture, then other considerations can be set aside. In this way, children from some communities are actively discriminated against. Their usual rights to child safeguarding into an open future waved aside. In a secular society, it is only religion's special privileges that are removed from public life not religion. In other words, equality before the law. Equal rights to express one's beliefs, to accompany equal responsibilities not to hurt other people by doing so. It's hard to ignore the similarities with the civil rights movement, the struggle to be treated equally, regardless of colour, gender, sexuality, and beyond that, the right to free expression for all. And considering the slow progress to these equalities, it's worth looking back at some of the obstacles that were faced along the way to their recognition in principle, as we know we have a way to go in practice. We medics are used to delving into dark corners with special instruments. <laughs> there is one such instrument for which no medical training is required. The retrospectroscope allows us to look back into the uh, murky depths of the past. It turns out we see the same obstacles time and time again. Apparently camouflaged at the time, these roadblocks to civil rights become uniquely visible with the retro spectroscope. The subjugation of women, the keeping of slaves, racial segregation, the prosecution of same-sex love, the total criminalisation of sexual health information and contraception. All of these nauseating, dangerous practices faced staunch, organised, institutional opposition on the road to change after which some people claimed false credit for their belated revelation. So why is change so slow? Why is it apparently so easy to look back into the past and mouth the words it must never happen again, whilst failing to see what's under our very noses? I gained an insight into the answer to this question in 2010. The head of ethics at the GMC, granted, well, she kindly granted me a meeting to discuss ritual genital cutting. She acknowledged my concerns, which were based largely on the GMC's own guidance elsewhere. But she asked me to understand just how deeply offended the Chief Rabbi would be were the GMC even to imply criticism of the sacred religious practice of the ritual forced cutting of a healthy child's normal penis. Her best guess, she told me, was 60 years for change to happen. 
In retrospect, change can seem obvious. At the time, necessary change is often thwarted by <coughs> fear of criticism, misplaced loyalties, skewed priorities, status quo bias, the vested interests of the privileged and inertia. It must never happen again. Make the care of your patient your first concern. We must not lose sight of the child. Are all meaningless platitudes if excuses are found not to put them into action? For without action, we go backwards, not forwards. The Conscientious Objections Medical Activities Bill is going through Parliament now. If enacted, it, it would allow healthcare professionals to extend their conscientious objection beyond the reasonable legislation we currently have on abortion, for example. The bill risks seriously obstructing pa some patients' treatment. So it's easy to parrot never again, never again about historic injustices, more challenging to recognise what's happening now, where far too many people are suffering today from the harmful imposition on them of other people's beliefs. Those people could be any one of us, struggling to be heard and listened to above the clamour of other people's beliefs. True kindness in healthcare can be as simple as sitting down with a patient and listening to hear what's important to them, and then honouring their wishes. Thank you.